want to read a couple of scriptures to you, and then uh, let's get started. You're going to love this today. Uh, Isaiah 46, verse 8 says, it says, remember this. Keep it in mind and take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. It says, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there's no one like me. I'm God. There's no one else like me. There is no other. I am God. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about, that will I do. And then a very famous passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Are you guys, we got this up there? Is anyone going to? Okay, he's got it. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We know that God works in all things. We know that God works. Let's pray. Father, thank you today that you're working Thank you that your hand is on every life that's here. By your sovereignty, we assemble together today. Let this word find a place in our heart and inspire us to love you and trust you more. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So God is always at work. From before you were born, you say, well, man, I let Christ into my life when I was 20 years old. Or I let Christ into my life when I was 13 years old. No, God in his sovereign hand was working even before you were born. Scripture says it over and over. So we know that God had his hand on your life, bringing you into this world. And even though you may have been through difficult things, God was still working. I took the kids up to South Carolina. I got a couple pictures here. Let's see here. Can we show those pictures? This is Everett and Stella. Erin was sick, so I left her and Grayson here. But look at Everett and Stella. This is us in South Carolina. These are my two oldest. And then we did a couple things there. We, uh, Everett, played with the horses. Look at this guy. Look at that face, y'all. And then we, you know, we did things that we couldn't do here in South Florida. We took the four-wheelers out. And we, you know, were hanging out. Look at Stella, how happy she is. I mean, we just had a blast up in the Carolinas. But, man, being there, and I was just reflecting on my life, and I was walking with my mom, and I was telling her, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in a small town, and it's like the armpit of America. You know, it's like, a, you know, just 5,000 people, you know, real small. And I, I just I was talking to my mom about this. When I was young, I just could not wait to get out of there. I mean, I just had, you know, city, city dreams. You know, like I wanted to be in a bigger city. I wanted to be away from there. I wanted to do more of my life. And, you know, I just could not wait to get out of there. And I, I think about my journey of leaving there at a young age, South Carolina, and going to Kentucky, and then coming down here, and, and just all the different things, and all the mistakes of my life, and all the good choices of my life. Somehow all those things work together to bring about who I am today. To bring about, you know, my family, my children, and and Coastal, all those things, that history of my life, I was just reflecting on that. It's been a journey, but it's God's hand has been there at every step. God's hand has been on my life, and and he's been, even through the difficult things and and the good things, he somehow worked everything to bring about his glory and my good. And this is a time of year often we start reflecting on you know, what happened this past year and all the things that happened. And then we start looking towards what's going to happen in the new year. Well, well, this is what I want to kind of impart to you today is that somehow you've got to recognize that God is over all that. That the God, that his sovereign hand, that you can trust him with your life in every way because you're, you may be making the decisions, but ultimately you're not in control. That somehow that there's a, there's a God who sits above time, that he sits above our lives, above the universe. He sees the end from the beginning, and somehow his sovereign hand is leading us, and he's orchestrating things for your good and his glory. And you could think that you may have blown it. You could think that you may have disappointed God or you failed God or, you know, it's over and I'll never be the same and I'll never get that back. But guess what? God has a way. I love that scripture in the Old Testament where it says, you know, it talks about, it's basically talking about spilt milk. How could you put milk back in a container? And it says that God devises a means to bring those back to him who are far away. So somehow even the parts of your life that you feel like 
are outside of God's perfect plan, that they're failures or their mistakes or their things you'll never get back. But guess what? God in his sovereignty devises a means to bring those things back for his good. Jeremiah 32, 17, I love this scripture. It says, ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm, and nothing is too hard for you. Guys, sovereign God, the Lord of the universe, nothing is too hard for him. And if you look with your own natural eyes and your own natural inclination and you reason out and you think about your will in things and your ability to make things right or your ability to embrace your future, guess what? It pales in comparison to God's sovereign power. We serve a sovereign God. This is something, man, that I have found such hope in in the last few years. Uh, you know, growing up, I grew up in, a, in an, basically in an environment that was very centered on man's will and, and man's ability and, and our performance and what we could do and our, you know, our ability to do good and to do, do right. And, but over the last few years, just oh God just really impressing on me his sovereignty and me trusting him with the church and trusting him with my family, trusting him with every area of my life because he's able and more qualified than me. We serve a sovereign God. There's no limits to God's rule. When I talk about a sovereign God, I'm talking about how he's the most high God. Don't lose me today. Follow with me on this because this is such a powerful thought. He's the most high God. He's never helpless, frustrated, or at a loss. I want you to see that he's always working. Even in your darkest moments, he's still working. Now, we got two things here that we could talk about. Let's see if I can write this up here. Because this is where people, oh, that doesn't work. There's 10 markers back here. How many of y'all think it'll take me to get to one that works? Let's see what happens here. Okay, here we go. Honey, am I spelling this right? Is that right, baby? There is a sovereign... T of God, okay, and then there is the free will of man. Now we think, you know, when we think about these two concepts, we think a lot of times we could argue that they are in opposition to one another. This is something I want to kind of discuss with you today because there's two camps. There's an Armenian camp and a Calvinistic camp, and a lot of times we find ourselves comfortable in one of these camps. We say, okay, God is totally sovereign and he's in control and we're like robots. Come on, anybody ever thought that? You know, sovereign God, we're robots. We don't make any of our own decisions. We don't do anything of our own will. It's God kind of directing all of our steps. And then there's this other side where people say, well, God gave us free will. And so we're ultimately in control of our life, the bad things of our life. You know, it's your fault. You got to deal with it because you made that decision. Or, or you know, the, the good things in your life, that's because you made a good choice or a good decision. These might be seem like two competing ideas, but today I kind of want to show you how ultimately they're not competing ideas, but God, who is over all things, actually works through the free will of man. We do have choices to make, but ultimately God is over our lives and our story. Are you following with me? And I want to show you a few things in the scripture and just talk through this so you can see that God is in control and that he is working in your life. Okay, now here's the big idea today. Look at this with me. Here's the big idea. The big idea is that God in his providence makes use of means. When I say means, I'm talking about your decisions, your choices, your, your power. You know, he makes use of you, your means, yet he is free to work without these means. He's above these means. He's against them at times. And at his pleasure, he does what he wills. The sovereignty of God does not exclude or annul the free will of man, but is above it, without it, and beyond it, and we can trust him with every area of our lives. Are you following with me? Come on, can I get a good amen right there? We're going to look at it one more time, and we're talking about two competing ideas. We're talking about the sovereignty of God, his ultimate control of the world and our lives, and we're also talking about our free will. We're not robots. God has given us, you know, he's given us conscience and choice. So we know that God and his providence, he makes use of those choices. He makes use of our decisions, but yet he's free to work without 
our decisions. He's above them, and sometimes he's against them, and it's at his pleasure, not of our choosing. His sovereignty does not exclude our free will, but it's above it, without it, and beyond it, and we can trust him with every area of our lives. This is a good message today. This is going to help you. If you can see this, if you get a revelation of this, this will really help you. Isaiah 46, verse 8 says this. It says, remember this. God is saying, remember this. I'm God and there's no other, there's no one like me. I want to tell you that God is other than. We can't compare God to anything human. We can't, when we think of God, we can't think of him in a sense of like we are, anything that we know. The best qualities, the, when we think of Superman, when we think of Thanos, when we think of, when we think of the Avengers, when we think of all the greatest and superhuman qualities that we could have, we cannot even compare those things to God. He's above those things. He is all, in a category all by himself. He, he calls himself holy. He's other than. He's outside of those qualities. His sovereign supremacy is beyond our understanding. I love the scripture where it says in Isaiah 40, he says, with whom then will you compare God? Look at this. To what image will you liken him? As for an idol or someone cast a goldsmith over, lays it with gold, fashions it with silver, change. Do you not know or have you not heard? Has it not been told to you? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? Go to that next one, bro. Uh, that he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, spreads them out like a tent to live in. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. I want you to think about how God is holy and how he's other than, how he's not like us in any way, how he doesn't even, all of our greatest qualities, he's beyond those things. Y'all following me today? I'm not talking about someone, just a good person. I'm not talking about how, you know, we relate to Jesus and we see how he was a good teacher and we see how he was powerful in miracles and he was strong in morals. Well, I know those things are great, right? And he's a revelation of God. But even beyond that, God is other than. Jesus is that ultimate revelation of him, but our minds can't even comprehend the depth and the magnitude of who he is. All of his attributes and beauty, the facets of God's glory. He says in Isaiah 46.10, he says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. This scripture is talking about the omniscience of God, the all-knowingness of God. God knows everything. The, the Library of Congress is like a matchbox of knowledge compared to God's supreme knowledge. Are you following with me? He's beyond this. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He has an incredible knowledge of your life. I love Acts 15 where it says that known to God of all of his works from the beginning. Known to God of all of his works from the beginning. See, he has an intricate knowledge of your life. Every detail of what's going on in your life, every detail of your past, every part where you failed, every part where you fo were fallen, he knew he was there. He saw. Scripture says that he hemmed us in behind and before. Before we were formed, he knitted us in our mother's womb. Before we were born, he knew our lives from the beginning to the end. Say, so, well, I've been in control of my life from the beginning. Think about it. I made all my own choices. Well, that's true. But I want you to know that there's a sovereign God over your life, orchestrating at your good and for his glory. Y'all following with me? Let's look at a couple things right here. <clears throat> Let's talk about a guy named Moses. You guys ever heard of Moses? I want to show you something. Think about this, okay? Now, Moses was born at a time when there was a decree that all the male babies should be killed. And his mom made a decision, right, to, to hide him in a little basket. You guys remember that? This is the free will of mom. Mom said, I'm not going to listen to the king. I'm not going to obey the Pharaoh. Not my baby. Come on, anybody? Know? Not my baby. Come on. And she says, no, I'm putting this little baby in a basket and I'm putting him in the river. Now, how many of y'all know that that little basket in the Nile was probably surrounded by crocodiles, but somehow in God's sovereignty, are y'all listening to me? It found its way to the river's edge where the queen, where the, where the princesses and the royalty were. Y'all following with me now, right? And it was scooped up and, and his aunt actually was there and he was raised in Egypt. Y'all following with me? Now how could that even happen, right? He was raised in Egypt in the Pharaoh's home. He killed a man. 
he murdered someone. You think it was God's choice for him to murder someone? I don't think so. But guess what? God used that decision to send him into the wilderness to meet with God at a burning bush. Y'all follow with me now, right? See how God used that? God, it was man's free will for him to kill someone. He didn't have to get angry and do that. He did it. Big mistake, sin. God didn't author it. God didn't approve of it, but it happened. But somehow God used it to get him into the wilderness to find himself at a burning bush. Y'all following with me? This is Moses. Think about Adam and Eve. Y'all following with me? Now God is using, I tell you, these things just go out on me. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Here we go. We got Adam and Eve. Now this is where we find God giving man free will. God says, you know what? You guys make your own choices, right? He gives them a conscience. He, he, they come alive to God. And, 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 and yes, he says, look, you can eat everything in this garden except for one thing. One thing, right? Man's free will. You have a choice to make. Well, guess what? What did he do? He did it. He did it. But guess what? That was the fall. So man made a choice to fall. But it says in the scripture, it says before the foundations of the world, there was a lamb that was slain. Before the foundations of the world, before they made that decision, God already provided a means. Y'all following with me today? Think about it for a second now. There was a fall, but before the fall, God already provided a means. He works beyond. He works against. He works with our choices to accomplish his sovereign will. Y'all following with me? Y'all see that? You see, man, yeah, we got a choice, but guess what? In the end. You know, that's what the scripture says in Proverbs. It says, many are the plans of a man's heart, but in the end, the Lord's purpose prevails. Amen. Many are the plans. Man makes his plans. We got our choices, but guess what? The purpose of God is always fulfilled. I think about our story here coming on this property. And... If you've heard this 10 times, just hear it again. But when we, you know, we came, we're, Mika had this vision, saw my face, hadn't saw this guy in 10 years, met him one time, calls us up, and somehow through, you know, just a series of circumstances, we start making these plans. We're going to merge the churches. We're going to come together. I'm out here one day on the sidewalk, and etched in the sidewalk is the, is the letters carved in the sidewalk, Rev. Jones, which is my name. If you go to revjones.me, that's my website. Come on now. I start researching the history of this building. 60 years to the day that we would come and occupy this property, Reverend Jones started this work. 60 years to the day, October 22nd, 1957, all the way fast forward to October 22nd, night or 2017. Come on now, y'all with me here? This was 20 years before I was born that God put my name in that sidewalk, that God purposed that we would see that and find that. What are we talking about here? Yeah, it was man's free will. We had our choices to make. The board here, they had a choice to make to embrace us. We had a choice to embrace them. We had a choice to make, but guess what? It was the sovereignty of God that brought us together. Y'all following with me? Come on now, are you listening today? This is good stuff. I think about uh, just two weeks, uh, last week, we had this, or a couple, few weeks back, we had this Halloween outreach. Now listen to this, guys. Listen, I'm talking about the sovereignty of God, how he works. God is working. I know you say, oh, well, we had a big altar call last week, and 30 people got saved, and 20 people were healed, and I saw it with my own eyes. Well, that's good. That's results. That's good. But, that, but listen, if this altar never fills up, if no one ever comes down here and you don't ever see anyone, you believe God is still working. He's working. We had that Halloween outreach, and we had a little tent set up out there on the street with candy and flyers. And I was just standing around hanging out. You guys know me. I'm not like an intense person when it comes to stuff like that, you know. But for some reason, I saw this guy. I, went, I grabbed a flyer. I just went right up to him. And I said, hey, man, here, I want you to take this, you, you know, feel free, what's your name, blah, 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 blah. 
He took that flyer, didn't say a word really, you know, kept on walking. Just two weeks ago, I get a call, a number I don't recognize, but I picked it up. And he says, is this Pastor Ron? I say, yeah, it's Pastor Ron. He starts crying, I mean profusely crying. I need you right now, I need you, I need you. I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to be there. I, I, gotta, I need to talk to you, I need you, I need you, I need you. I said, hold on, man, what's going on? He says, man, I was at that, I came walking by, there was a whole crowd of people walking by your church. And he says, you came right through that crowd. You didn't talk to anyone else, but you gave me this flyer. And he said, man, he said, everything in my life is falling apart. Everything, da, da, da. He just starts telling me his story. He says, and I was on my hands and knees last night. And I was praying and crying out to God. And he says, God, show me your church. God, show me your face. I'm supposed to call you. I'm supposed to talk to you. I'm supposed to be there. Guys, he came last week. He came down here through many tears. We prayed together. I gave him a 101 book. He's been going through that discipleship book this week. Come on, y'all telling me God's not working? Y'all telling me God doesn't work? I couldn't have orchestrated that. I just went and gave that guy a flyer, but God knew that he needed that flyer. And God knew that that would happen, and God showed him in a vision. He showed him this building. He showed him me, and God brought him here, and now God is working in his life. Wow. You know, there was, I was meeting with the guys a couple weeks ago. This is so crazy. Before Christmas. And we were saying, man, who, who needs something this Christmas? We, you know, we, we should help people. Who needs something this Christmas? And this one particular person's name came up. And some of the stuff they were going through and the things that they had, kind of burdens that had been dropped on them here at the last minute. And we said, man, we got to pray for this person. Guys, I want to tell you, it was a couple days later that I got a text message for somebody in the, ch in the church. And they said, hey, we want to bless someone this Christmas. What about that person that this, 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 and this? And it was the person that we were talking about. I told the guys, don't y'all know that God is thinking of that person? Don't you know that God is thinking of them? See, we were thinking of them. But God was thinking of them. God was orchestrating. He was devising a means to bless them, to do good to them wasn't out of any person's choice, but only of God. It's good, right? Think about the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Let's look at Acts chapter 4. This is the, the believers have gathered to pray in Acts chapter 4. And in their prayer, this is what they said, speaking of Jesus' crucifixion and his punishment. Listen to this. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city conspired against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and your will had decided beforehand. Guys, even in the darkest moments of our life, you say, well, is God orchestrating my pain? No. But God is using it. He's using our suffering. He's using our failings. He's using our shortcomings to bring about his perfect plan. Just talking about my story, just thinking about how God's sovereign hand over my life from drug addiction. All those years ago from, from drugs and alcohol, and all the things, I mean, there's just so many things that I've done, so many mistakes I've made, but somehow God is working his sovereignty settles our uncertainty. doesn't matter how many mistakes you've made, how bad your upbringing was, how tough your parents were, how much you didn't receive love, you didn't get this, you didn't get that. It doesn't matter. I don't say that in any rude way. Your story is important. But no matter what the story is, we know that God has been working. Isaiah 46, 8 says this, from the east, I summon a bird of prey. This is God's power over creation. And a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, I'll bring about him. I'll tell you another story. You guys ever heard of a guy named Cyrus? Isaiah 44. Cyrus was a, a Persian king. 150 years before Cyrus was born, it was prophesied about him by name. Cyrus 
would rise to power and make a decree and he would, he would, he would bless Israel and he would he did all these great things, called him by name 150 years before his birth. He was a Persian pagan, pagan king. 150 years. But God summoned him. Can you imagine that? Think about that for a second. Think about his parents on the day that he was born. Was it their free will to name him Cyrus? But did God call him 150 years before? So we got free will, but there's sovereignty. God's sovereignty over our lives. He's the most high God. He's the most high God. He's the most high God. You can trust him with every area of your life. Every facet of your life you can trust him with. I'll tell you this, you're going to make someone sovereign. It's either going to be you or it's going to be God. Either you're going to be sovereign over your life or you're going to allow God to be sovereign. There's a story in Daniel chapter 2 of a great king called Nebuchadnezzar. Anybody ever heard of Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was so full of himself. He was so full of ego. He called him his own self. He referred to himself as his majesty. <laughs> this guy was an egomaniac. And in Daniel chapter 2, he has a dream. And in this dream, he, he sees a great big tree. And its branches spread out over the plain. And the birds and the, and the, the beasts find shelter there. And it's, there's food there. And there's just, it's, but all of a sudden, an angel comes and chops down this tree. And there's a stump left, Right? So it will grow back, but the tree's chopped down. He can't figure this dream out for anything, so he calls on Daniel. And Daniel says, hey, man, I got the interpretation for your dream, but it's not good news. He says, I wish this was for somebody else. But old great Nebuchadnezzar, he says, you are that tree. He says, your kingdom stretches and people find shelter and safety, but you'll be chopped down. You'll be separated from your people. And for seven years, you'll be in the wilderness. And the dew of heaven will fall on you. But you'll come back. The Bible says a few chapters later that Nebuchadnezzar is walking on his terrace. And he's looking out at his vast kingdom. And he's saying, he's saying oh, majesty, your kingdom stretches. And he's, he's talking about himself. But the Bible says before the words can get off of his lips. He's separated from his people. He finds himself in the wilderness. And for seven years, the Bible says that his nails grew out like the claws of a bird and his hair like the feathers of an eagle. And, and he ate with the wild beasts for seven years until he acknowledged the Most High. And Nebuchadnezzar himself, he said, my sanity returned when I looked up to heaven and I acknowledged that he is the most high God. And he, is the, he exalts and the nations are in his hand and control. His sanity came back and he was back with his people. Guys, I want to tell you, you have to acknowledge the most high God. Someone will be sovereign. It'll either be you or God. But he is the most high. Amen. So I don't know where you've been. I don't know what has been going on in your mind. I don't know what lies you've been believing. I don't know if the pluralism of our secular world has invaded your thoughts. And you've kind of taken Jesus and put him here with other gods. Or maybe you've been in control of your own destiny. And you've been striving and working and it's like, man, you're so disappointed when you don't see the results that you want. You're so disappointed when you don't see those things that you, you're, you're desiring. But I'm here to tell you that he's the most high. That our trust has got to be in him. Our hope has got to be in him. 
We have to acknowledge him. Today's the day that you do that. And just like Nebuchadnezzar, I pray your sanity returns. And a burden comes off of you. And you say, God, you're the most high. And you can echo with Paul. And I know that all things, God works. I know that in all things, God works. Father, today, it's in Jesus' precious name that I lift up 